history. Um, we don't spend a whole lot of time on it because uh, we don't have a lot of time. Um, now, the, the Greeks have given credit for the first attempt to explain why chemical changes occur, but I think you better take that with a grain of salt. The Egyptians did it, the Babylonians did it. Oh, yeah. The Chinese did it way before. Yeah. So, Maybe maybe what they're referring to here is is they're trying to make a logical explanation for what's happening, not just cookbook or having a a guild of those who know how to make gunpowder. Well, the the gunpowder thing was that somebody was trying to figure out the answer of life in Nepal. Yep. Uh, and that brings us to the topic of alchemy, <laughs> which was. Uh, fairly popular, uh, especially in Europe, and uh, was actually uh, the study of alchemy, while it, it might have been, uh, it, it was probably different for each person that was using it. Some of them, I mean, the, the rap they give, they get oftentimes is uh, trying to change gold into lead, but uh, that's too simplistic an answer. They were doing, trying to do a lot of things. Elixir of Life was one. They were still interested in that at the European alchemy. They're still yeah. interested in that. We're well, still trying to figure that out. Well, yeah. Well, hopefully, we're on a we're on a better path for it now. Um, alchemy was actually passed down from uh, master to apprentice. In other words, and the secrets that were the knowledge that was gained was held pretty close to the vest. You didn't disseminate it like. That's one of the premises of the uh, scientific approach these days is if you don't publish your work, it didn't happen. If you don't tell everybody about it that you can, then you might as well not have done it. Uh, a lot of them are herbal healers and that's where alchemist fire comes from and even Greek fire. Mm -hmm. We don't even know how to make Greek fire anymore. No. We speculate based on reports of, of uh, how feared it was and the effect it had on the enemy, then we can make some logical jumps, but we really don't know the formulation. Um, but by the time uh, modern chemistry was beginning to develop, uh, alchemy had already identified a number of elements. Um, and uh, quite a few mineral acids. Uh, mineral acids were used to dissolve substances and uh, many reactions took place um, using mineral acids. But those, those preceded modern chemistry and the modern chemists uh, took advantage of that knowledge. Robert Boyle is given credit as being the first chemist and we put those in quotes because at that time they weren't called chemists. They were the common terminology then was natural philosophers. <clears throat> but he did perform quantitative experiments. And this was in the 17th century. And uh, uh, proposed a definition for an element based on his experiments. We were also developing, scientists were also developing uh, various laws as they gained more knowledge about natural systems. Um, they were able to formulate laws that would say, this is what happens when you do that. In other words, there, were, there was no why about it. It was just, uh, uh, this 
predicts what will happen if you do something. One of those was uh, by the uh, French chemist or natural philosopher, Lavoisier, the law of conservation of mass. Lavoisier noticed that in a chemical reaction, uh, if he uh, weighed everything that went into the reaction and weighed everything that came out, the masses did not differ. Question, is yep. the conservation of mass, because uh, what, what people say, matter cannot be created or destroyed, is that? Right. But it can technically be? Oh yeah. Changed into an energy form which has been lost, which is kind of destroyed? They just can't measure it. Exactly. Right, it takes, in a chemical reaction, there is a slight change of mass, because that's where the energy comes from, or where it goes to. If it's endothermic, it, of course, the energy is converted into mass. But most uh, chemistry labs don't have the uh, instrumentation to measure that difference. You can measure the difference if you experienced a, a nuclear reaction of some kind. There's a huge difference there. There's right. a lot of lost matter. And a lot of energy. <laughs> so, uh, um, but for our purposes, this law holds. The, uh, then Proust came along. Of course, Lavoisier, you know, he, he was working around the time of the French Revolution. Right? So, so he did pretty good, well for himself. It was in, and most natural philosophers were independently wealthy at that time. Uh, Lavoisier made a little extra change by uh, buying a commission from the crown to collect taxes. In those days, the crown said, this is how much tax I want. Um, you deliver. And if you collect more than that, you keep the excess. So I don't know how honest Lavoisier was, but by the time of the French Revolution, everybody hated tax collectors. Right? So, and uh, one of them actually had a grudge against him and sent him to the guillotine. Then along came Proust. And Proust uh, noticed that um, any compound once it was purified, um, would have the exact mass by mass composition of each element in the compound. Didn't matter what the origin of the compound was. For instance, you could take uh, water and distill it and get it reasonably pure, and you identify that as water. You could also react hydrogen and oxygen, and that would produce water. And once you've got the two, uh, these waters from different sources, you can't tell where they came from. They have the same composition no matter what their source. That's what Proust said. The one that often gets confused with uh, definite proportions is multiple proportions. And in multiple proportions, Dalton said that uh, when you have two elements in a compound, um, and you have different compounds with the same elements, the, if you standardize one element at a unit mass, say one gram of, of that element in this compound, then the other elements in the compound are ratioed by whole numbers. So for instance, and this, this explains, really explains why, uh, but Dalton didn't know this at the time. So if you have, um, let's say, uh, NO, NO2, NO3, you can, that could be charged or not. I'm just going to leave the charge off and we just say it's that. So this, what we call a homologous series, you have nitrogen and oxygen together. But these are valid compounds and they're different from each other. But once you've identified that you have both nitrogen and oxygen in there, then the ratio, if you hold this one constant, as we do in this formula, then each one of these is in ratio, whole number ratios. So you have twice as much of this in this one than that one, twice as much in that one, uh, three times in that one. Now this explains why, but Dalton didn't know that at the time. So that's the law of multiple proportions. <clears throat> Um, then 
then after a couple of centuries actually of gathering all this data and developing laws and some of them failed some of them worked Dalton decided to try to synthesize these things together try to make a coherent uh, theory out of everything that he knew and one of the first propositions of his atomic theory was that uh, each element is made up of tiny particles called atoms. Atomless meaning the smallest. Huh? Atomless meaning the smallest. Yeah. Atom means not cut. A means not. Atomos means to cut. So this is a Greek word. And it, the concept comes from the ancient Greeks. <clears throat> so he said everything's made of small atoms, every element. It's the smallest particle you can get that still has characteristics of that element. And that's where he differed from the ancient Greeks, because the Greeks thought that every atom was just alike. There's only one type of atom. But Dalton said, no, for each element, you have a different type of atom. So you can have one atom, and it'll be that element, or you can have 10, 20, a billion. You still have that element. <clears throat> Um, and like I said, these the atoms of these elements, within the element, they're all identical. That's what he said. Um, and then atoms of one element are fundamentally different than the atoms of another element. That's why they have different properties, both physical and chemical. So that would be, was it like a hydrogen three? It's three neutrons? No, that would be two neutrons and one proton. Okay. So they are a little bit different. Yes, we're going to talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> and when chemical, when compounds form, uh, there's simply a combination of different elements to form uh, the compound. And during a chemical reaction, all that happens is you just reshuffle the elements. So that explains uh, the law of of uh, conservation of mass. If you only just shuffle the elements around, then you've got the same mass after as before. You've developed different properties in the products from the reactants, uh, but you haven't created or destroyed any mass, at least as far as we know. And you have the same number, relative number of atoms from the reactant side that show up on the product side. That also confirms that uh, mass is not created or destroyed. So I sort of I combined that one and this one together. So the atoms themselves are not changed in the process. Okay, after Dalton, um, we get uh, a couple of fellows. Uh, Gay-Lussac did some work prior to Avogadro, but Avogadro um, built upon Gay-Lussac's work, uh, and that's the typical way that science works. You know, you stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say. So, um, Gay-Lussac uh, was interested in the relationship of volumes of gases as they react. So he would take a volume of oxygen, a volume of hydrogen, react and see the volume of the product that you get. Temperature and pressure. And temperature and pressure have to be held constant. He learned that for sure. So whenever you're dealing with gases, and we'll, we'll cover this again later, um, in order to describe a gas, you need to know temperature, pressure, uh, volume, and mole. Those four factors. Uh, define the, the, the physics, anyway, of um, a gas. So he, he held temperature and pressure constant, and he watched the change in the volume of gases as the reaction proceeded. Uh, Avogadro capitalized on, the, on his uh, work, and Avogadro, what Avogadro said was that if you have <coughs> Consider these spheres of the same volume. Right? They have two volumes, a 
They're equal. We're going to hold the temperatures constant, right? And we're going to we're going to hold um, temperature, volume, pressure, and pressure constant. Volume's the same, pressure's the same, temperature's the same. What Avogadro says, if all of these are the same, then moles are the same. You have exactly the same number of particles in each one of them. It doesn't matter what the gas is. Right? So if you know that this one has the same number of particles as that one, then the difference in mass can only be due to a difference in the mass of each of the particles. And that was actually a, a revelation to the scientific community in uh, 1865. The chemists from all over Europe, uh, both those who were employed by companies and those who were at university, were finding it difficult to explain why their reactions went wrong. Now for university professors, that was no big deal, except that they couldn't publish anything that was meaningful. But for those chemists that worked for companies, they were costing their owners lots of money. And they were determined to figure out why. So they all got together in uh, Karlsruhe, Austria. Uh, and uh, said, oh, we're going to figure this thing out. Right? So they were there for I don't know how long, a week maybe, uh, going to meetings and uh, drinking German beer, of course. And they all walked out, they just threw up their hands and walked away. Yeah, no, we can't figure this they out. couldn't figure it out. So as they were leaving, there was a, a young, let me see if I spell his name right. Canazzaro. He was an Italian, young Italian chemist who didn't have a big reputation, but he had published some work. And he based his work on Avogadro's law. So apparently that hadn't been disseminated very much, or he worked it out some more so that they could understand what the implications were. He was handing out reprints of his papers as they left. And they all, you know, politely took a copy, went back to their various cities. And some of them read it, and light bulbs started going on all over the place. Because now they could relate their reactants and products based on number of particles rather than just masses. Because mass is all they knew up at this point. Now that they knew the ratio of particles, then when they when you write out an equation, um, you know what should be going in, what should be coming out, and how many of each. And then they were able to figure out what's going wrong with their reactions. This is the mass of one gas is less than the mass of another gas. And, and another, uh, say for example, oxygen is a, has a gas and nitrogen is a gas. Yeah. Not equal. Nitrous oxide is a gas. Right. In mass. Different masses. Yeah. Yes. True. So the fact that the that the number of molecules was the same meant that they could figure out the mass of they, each of these particles. They could use right. In fact, they didn't have to throw away all their data. They just go back and look at their mass data and interpret it in terms of number of particles. Then they could actually see what was happening in their reaction. Okay, so this was basically Gilusac's work. Uh, two volumes of hydrogen, one volume of oxygen, only give you two volumes of water, vapor. Right? So two plus one is two. <laughs> In chemistry, that works. <clears throat> but Gilusac didn't didn't work it out far enough. It took Avogadro to do that. Sometimes it's one plus one equals two, but it's only one plus one equals two. When you consider the reaction that hydrogen and chlorine, or hydrogen and chlorine, one of these, one of these gives you two of those. Although okay. with water, it's H two, it's H two plus O two, right. is two H two O. Is one H two O and then. Yeah. So two plus one is two, or one. Actually, one plus. It would be one plus one is two. And 
Because the one plus a half is equal to two. Because you have to have the, the same ratio. Two to one to two is one to half to one. All right, we'll talk about that more later. <clears throat> okay. So this is what, uh, well, this is a, a look at the formation of water from hydrogen and oxygen gas. So two plus one is two, not three. Okay. Now we're going to find out, um, to really understand chemistry, in other words, um, what's going on during a reaction or even why a reaction occurs. Why some reactions occur and some don't easily. Though. We need to know something about the atom itself. You know, what's the atom made of? And one of the first people who to began elucidating this in a scientific fashion was J.J. Thompson. Um, at this time, the big thing was static electricity. You know, in fact, before this, static electricity was big. It was a it was a party favor. Uh, you have these uh, static generators, and you crank them up, and then everybody would hold hands, and one person would touch the static source, and everybody would jump, and they'd all giggle and have have some more wine. It was fun. <laughs> but, is that, is that <laughs> adult, even a small amount of adults, will cause nerve damage? Oh yeah. So it doesn't take much. They were causing the damage themselves. Oh yeah, yeah, right. right. When you consider the uh, the potential that's that's generated in a, a nerve cell or a muscle cell, it's measured in millivolts. Uh, so J.J. Thompson postulated that these uh, there were negatively charged particles in uh, atoms, and he did that because uh, one device, the cathode ray tube, was was available at the time. The technology was available. In fact, he built it on to, uh, to his own specifications so he could conduct his experiments. And he eventually devised experiments that would uh, measure the ratio of the charge of the electron to its mass. So he identified the ratio. He did not identify the, the mass of the electron, but he knew that there, there was a ratio and it was uh, a pretty small charge, uh, a, a large charge to mass ratio, small mass to a big charge. An electron is literally almost zero mass. It is very, very small, yes. To the point where it's like. In, uh, yeah, and in chemical reactions, we basically ignore it for mass. Right. Uh, it, it serves another purpose. <clears throat> but he also knew that. Um, Isolated elements were neutral, right? So if you've got these negative particles, there have to be positive particles there to neutralize them. They knew that much. And well, this is what his cathode ray looks tube looks like. This is a reconstruction. And they knew that um, negative particles bent one way and positive bent the other way, depending on whether you had a static field on, on either side of the tube or you used a magnet. Use a horseshoe magnet and make them bend. Uh, negative particles one way, positive the other way. So he was able to separate uh, ionized atoms by mm -hmm. separating the electrons from the protons. Yep. So he produced positive ions and negative ions. So we knew those were both there. Um, then along came uh, Robert Millikan, who was, who was uh, an American. And he was determined to find out. How much an electron weighed, right? So he, he built this instrument. There's a um, um, a vacuum chamber essentially, but there was there were some uh, air mo molecules left in there for so that he, he could develop charges. Plus, he had a fine mist of oil that was sprayed into the chamber, and the electrons would attach themselves to these oil drops. And then he would let them float into an electric field, and he could control 
the strength of the electric field and quantify it. So by some calculations, he determined that, well, this oil drop uh, had to have uh, this amount of mass of charge attached to it. And if you do a whole, he did thousands of these experiments. Some of them would be this much mass, some of them would be this much, some of them would be this much, but they were always unitary multiples of mass until he got to one that was, that he determined, uh, and he argued in his papers, that this was the lowest amount of charge you could get. And he identified that mass as this kilograms, then a minus 31 for an electron. So that's like, legitimately, that's almost no. Mm -hmm. And uh, he published his work, you know, that was, that was expected. And people reproduced his work, and eventually we used different techniques to determine the mass of the electron, and found out that it's most other ways that it, it's determined come out pretty close to that. Right? So that's the verification. <clears throat> a fine mass of oil drops is free into the top chamber. Oil drops acquire a charge from air molecules ionized by an X-ray source. When the voltage on the charged plates is adjusted properly, the drop can be suspended between the plates. Several measurements allow determination of the charge of a single electron. Okay. This is one case where he didn't have his graduate students do it for him. <laughs> He did these experiments himself. Well, he taught some people how to do it. But uh, for this purpose, he did those measurements himself. He and several other people who watched the thing, but he actually was part of the experiment. He didn't have other people do it. OK, so that identifies um, electrons and, by inference, protons. <coughs> <clears throat> and then there was also a research being done on types of radiation because we knew that certain elements were unstable and when they decayed they produced a different element plus they gave off certain types of radiation and at this point they would only identified three types there are several others now but these were the main types available Sweet. gamma rays are just simply light Right. They're very high energy, <clears throat> very low frequency, no, high frequency, low wavelength, <clears throat> light, and can do serious damage to your cells. Uh, beta particles were identified as nothing more than electrons, only they're very high speed electrons, and they originate from the nucleus. And then alpha particles. Um, are basically helium nuclei, two protons, two neutrons, and a two plus charge. So they're massive by comparison. So gamma rays do the most state, do the most damage. Beta rays cause the most sicknesses. Yeah, no, uh, it's easy to stop a beta particle. You just need a sheet of paper. So it's easy to start and stop an alpha and a beta particle with gamma things and everything. Um, a gamma gamma um, is difficult to attenuate. Right? It doesn't must be lead though. Lead shield, right? Uh, alpha particles, they can do damage if you inhale them. If you get them inside your body, then they will do some serious damage. Or if you get a, an alpha emitter. Uh, ingested or inhaled <clears throat> then it'll continue to emit from the inside and that's like you know let the wolf into your house okay um uh, by this time there were there was one theory about how atoms were constructed one said they had They had um, protons and neutrons, I mean, protons and electrons scattered, just like a plum pudding. And uh, they gave uh, uh, oh, shoot. 
<clears throat> they gave Lord Kelvin credit for that one. Some people think he stole it from somebody. But anyway, this model uh, says that they're just mixed together. Right? Uh, Rutherford didn't believe it. Rutherford thought that there was a very dense nucleus in the center. And then the electrons were out here. Right, so since electrons have very little mass, this is essentially empty space. So he devised an experiment called the gold, the gold foil experiment uh, to tell the difference. And it would be easy to determine which one was the correct model. So he used gold because gold was, was uh, uh, very easy to hammer out to just a few atoms thick. He used that as his target. And he had a source of alpha particles that he, uh, uh, of course, contained in some sort of shielding. And these alpha particles were heading out in all directions. And then he had a, a slit here and a slit here. Why did he have two slits? Because if you only have one slit, you could come in from this angle and you'd still have a beam that spreads. Right? So if you have two slits, the only ones that are going to get through are the ones that are straight through there. That. So it, that, that's called collimation. Or the straight beam of alpha particles. And here's your gold foil. And then he set up detectors. Um, let's see, 1911. They probably weren't electronic. They were probably like film. The photographic film scattered uh, position around. And he said, if the plum pudding model is uh, accurate, then this ought to go, you have a spot right there. That's it. Right? Because they're so diffuse in the atom, they're spread out. But if, if uh, the uh, nuclear atom model is correct, then you'll get most of them end up over here, right? Because most of the atom is empty space. But occasionally, one of these particles will slam into the nucleus, right? And it might just hit a glancing blow, you know, end up over here, or over here. Some of them will hit more directly, and then over here, and some of them will hit smack on and end up back over here. And that's exactly what happened. So that's how he said, he said, all right. That's it. I proved it. <laughs> Story's over. The atom is is uh, nuclear. In other words, that's a very dense nucleus, and they knew that by that time the protons were carrying most of the mass along with neutrons, and the electrons were just out here. This is important because when we start considering chemical reactions. When two atoms approach each other, what do they see first? Electrons. They see electrons first. So electrons are central to chemical reaction. Now that we know where they are, or more uh, yeah. actually, actually where they're not, we know where they're not. True, <laughs> they're not in the nucleus, and they're not in specific places around the. Right. Okay. So. Uh, some elements, by this time, we could separate elements uh, based on their individual atomic masses. Um, I won't go into the details of that, but you can separate them. And it turns out that they're not all the same mass. Uh, for most elements, the vast majority of the atoms in that element are one mass. But there's some of them that are either heavier or lighter. But they have the same number of protons for each element. That's what determines the element, the number of protons. And that number is given to you right here. Okay, that's the atomic number. That's the number of protons in the element. You can't change that. If you change that, you got a different element. And uh, if you change the number of protons, you got to change the number of electrons. So you've got to leave the electrons and protons alone for a neutral atom. 
but we knew that they were heavier than we could account for by the number of protons. So we had to have another particle, the neutron, which has no charge, but has almost the same mass of the proton. In fact, if you add this one to that one, you get about this one. Because it's postulated that when a nucleus decays, radioactive decay, the beta particle that originates from the nucleus comes from the breakup of a neutron. And it leaves behind a proton, sends off a, an electron. Okay, plus a little energy. So that's the difference in the masses. Okay, so we've got these three fundamental particles that make up an atom. Protons, neutrons in the nucleus, electrons in the space around it. Um, and the nucleus is extremely small compared to the volume of the atom, as determined by a number of different methods. Well, the volume of an atom is technically uh, universal. What do you mean by that? Uh, an electron can be anywhere in the universe. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. Not in this class anyway. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, probabilistically, you know, the probability of finding an electron is very high in certain regions around the atom, but prob the probability of finding that electron somewhere else in the universe, there's, there's a small probability. Okay, so this is just is an idea, a representation of um, the nucleus of the atom uh, compared to its total volume. So it's extremely small. Atoms are mostly into space. Okay, so these different atoms, the atoms that have different masses for each element are called isotopes. Okay. Uh, many of them having different new numbers of neutrons are stable. That is, they don't decay. And for these up here, most of them, um, their isotopes are stable. But as you get heavier and heavier, uh, you get more potential for radioactive decay. And some of these elements, uh, especially the ones that we've created in the lab, they're all radioactive. They last on the order of microseconds. And It's actually really hard to quantify them because there are certain properties that you can't determine. That's going to have that. We can only predict. Okay, so these isotopes have different numbers of neutrons. That's where they differ. Okay, when well we have a let's see if I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, yeah, I've got a slide on that. So this uh, sodium might be have uh, 11 protons and 12 neutrons, or it might have 11 protons and 13 neutrons. They're the same element because they have the same number of protons, but they have different number of neutrons, so they're isotopes of one another. Now, <clears throat> um, I'm going to use X as a symbol for, for any of the elements, since there are no Xs up here. Yes, it is. Yeah that one, but there's nothing with just an X. So there are four positions around the symbol that are reserved for certain information. This one is reserved for the number of protons, the atomic number. So for chlorine, it would be 17. This one is reserved for the mass number. And the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Okay. Um, this one is for number of atoms, right? and this one is for charge. Right? There's no charge, there's nothing there. You've only got one of them, there's nothing there. Okay, so if we have uh, 23 protons and 28 neutrons, what's the mass number? 51. Right? What's the element? Vanadium. 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 Yep. So the atomic numbers increase from top to bottom, from left to right. 
But if you're looking for one and you have a number, you just follow along. You get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go. Eventually, it's the right one. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, holding atoms together in molecules. You can have two types, roughly. Okay. And I, whenever we say something in absolute terms in sciences, chemistry in particular, there are always exceptions and there's always gray area. Okay. So first we do is, is just a, a, a hatchet cut in the middle and say this and that. Or we cut it two times and this, this and that. But in this case, we're going to cut it and say, some compounds are formed by elements that share electrons. When they come together, their inner, their electrons, um, for the time being, that's good enough. Their electrons are mixing, but they spend some time close to this atom and sometimes close to that atom. So they're basically shared. Those are covalent bonds, and these are the the stronger of the bonds, the covalent. Bonds. When you form a molecule, uh, these take the most energy to break. Halogen atoms will combine to form single bonds. Atoms combine to share electrons, forming a covalent bond. The covalent bond is often shown as a link between atoms, although it is actually a sharing of electrons. The diatomic chlorine molecules maintain their bonds even if they collide with other molecules. Uh, yep. This is because some elements in there form other than the other than the um, noble gases are charged to some point. In uh, in the in the basic form of like four. They don't have to be charged, no. No, they can you can you can bring together two chlorine atoms that are not charged, and they'll react to form that chlorine. Because I thought it was because the the, there was seven electrons for eight protons. Okay, we're not talking about charge there. We're talking about uh, completing orbital. Okay. We ain't got there yet. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. <clears throat> There are cases in which um, one atom has a weak hold on its electrons and the other one has a very strong pull on those electrons. And in those cases, the electrons will be transferred from one to the other. And when that happens, you get two bona fide ions. The electrons are transferred. And then what holds them together is electrostatic charge. These types of associations, these bonds, are weaker than covalent bonds. And most often, the uh, formation of these bonds occur between metals and nonmetals. In fact, always. Thus, and the more, the farther apart they are on the periodic table, that these are metals, these are nonmetals, the farther apart they are, the stronger the ionic bond. Thus. I'm sorry? Thus. Uh, yeah, iron and oxygen, okay. or table salt, sodium and chlorine. Right, so when you bring sodium and chlorine, sodium metal, which is a solid, toxic and very, and chlorine gas together, which is a toxic, right? They're, they're both, you don't want to handle them with your bare hands or breathe them. Um, what happens is, the electrons from sodium, one electron transfers to one of the chlorines. So you need two of them, right? So each sodium transfers an electron to each chlorine. And you end up with sodium and chlorine ions, which is what this represents. And actually you have two of them. Which makes a crystal. Right. And they don't form molecules. In other words, molecules are Particles that behave independently uh, as a unit, I should say, as a unit. So, like water molecules, 
Those are characteristic of covalently bound compounds. If you form uh, ions, then you get uh, some sort of crystal lattice where you have, in actuality, you have a, an arrangement of positive and negative ions in this crystal lattice. <clears throat> Uh, but they're locked in place. Right. Unless they're in water. Uh, right. If you put them in water, then, then the water comes in, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, and just tears that crystal apart. But uh, let's see, terminology. Uh, the positive ones, not just sodium, but any positive ion, is a cation. And any negative one is an anion. And anything that's got a permanent charge is an ion. Right. So um, any one of these, when they form ions, they only form a single charge. Alkaline metals, single charge. Alkaline earths form two plus charge. Uh, this family, down to about here, they're all plus threes. And on the other side, of course, noble gases don't charge unless you force them. Uh, the halogens form negative charge, negative ones. These, negative two, and that is when they're in ionic association. Right? So if you look at your periodic table, you might see multiple charges here. But those aren't necessarily charges. Those could be referencing oxidation states, which is a slightly different concept. But when we're talking about ionic compounds, these are minus ones, minus twos, minus threes, plus threes, plus two, plus one. And then these guys in here, oh, are, weird. they kind of flip back and forth. It depends. For the carbides, um, carbon's going to be a negative ion because it's usually combined with a, a metal. And the metal tends to be positive, so carbon tends to be negative. Just as an example. All right, we got to get this chapter out of the way. So, because we have a lab to do today, in the computer lab. Water on the left is a molecular substance that exists as a liquid at room temperature. Sodium chloride on the right is an ionic substance that forms solid crystals at room temperature. Molecular water is covalent bonds holding hydrogen atoms to oxygen atoms. But there are no bonds between molecules, so they move freely in the liquid. The ions in sodium chloride are held together by ionic bonds, which restrict motion of ions in the solid crystal. Okay. So, uh, for these ionic compounds, if they're in a solid lattice like that, which they all up are at room temperature and pressure, um, will they be electrical insulators or conductors? Yeah, ions, right? What do you need? You don't just need ions if you're going to make a conductor, right? Those ions have to be mobile. So if you if you if you put a positive and negative electrode on one side to measure a current, then on a solid crystal like that, you won't get any. They're insulators. The only way you can transfer a charge through an ionic substance is either melt it so that the ions are free to move or dissolving some liquid. Right, so salt water would be a conductor. Um, oh, water full of less conductors. Yeah. Uh, liquid sodium chloride is a good conductor. It's also a good heat uh, sink. Uh, sodium chloride, there have been nuclear reactors that have been built with sodium, liquid sodium chloride as the coolant. It seems odd. <laughs> you got to get it really hot. But then it can absorb more heat. Okay, so for this one, let's see if we can figure this one out. We have an isotope that has a plus one charge, and we have 54 electrons in that um, ion. That's a cation, right? Positive. Oops. <laughs> 
Um, and what else? We have 78 neutral. Okay, I use a little n with a zero here, that's a neutron. If I use a little n without a zero, that's moles. Okay, mm -hmm. just, to, just to make a, so you don't get confused. Um, for, for later. So what's the mass number of this isotope? Well, what do we need to know for the mass number? Right, that's the question. Right here, we gotta answer the question. Mass number, is equal to protons plus neutrons, right? So how many neutrons we have? Okay, we've got that one covered. But how many protons do you have? Well, if it's a plus one charge, there's only 40, 54 electrons, so that would be 55 protons. Right. Everybody got that? No. <laughs> it's the difference in the charge in numbers that makes the charge. Because 54 of these electrons will be balanced by 54 protons, right? So if you take these, those are neutral, what do you have left over? One proton, one positive charge, okay? So now we know how many protons there are. We can do the mass number, right? 133, is it? What element is that, by the way? 55 protons. Um, Can you see it from there? Is it cesium? Uh huh. That was, that was, that was <laughs> misplaced cesium was uh, um, yeah, SC, that's the CS. Uh, scandium? Yeah. Right here. I always think that's cesium, not the other way around. You're not dyslexic, are you? No, it's okay. just it's just a weird yeah. thing. Sometimes I get confused with cerium, which is C E. Right here. Uh, okay. So which one of these are still I'm gonna run out of time if I'm hurry. Which one of these statements are still true regarding Dalton's um, Atomic theory. Elements are made of tiny uh, particles called atoms. That's still true. All atoms of a given element are identical. Nope. <laughs> Not anymore because you have isotopes. Right? That one's false. A given compound always has the same relative numbers and types of atoms. Uh, yes. I had to think about that for a second. A compound always has the same relative numbers and types of atoms. That is true. The formula tells you what it is. Atoms are indestructible. Untrue. Right. Yeah, we can, they radioactive decay. I mean, they do it on their own, or sometimes we can do it for them. And you can even split a hydrogen atom. Yeah. Which is a one proton. You can actually destroy the proton. Yeah, that's true. We're not going to go there, though. That's nuclear physics. Okay, so those two are still true. Now, the periodic table, um, if you haven't noticed, is subdivided into metals and nonmetals. So here's that, that line that divides the two. You got, I gave you that extra credit already, didn't I? Okay, good. So here's your dividing line for metals and nonmetals. And um, uh, for, for our purposes now, if it's on this side, it's a non-metal. If it's on this side, it's a metal. So most of the periodic table is metals. Technically speaking, though, there are a few in here, like this one, that one, this one, this one, and this one, right in here, that are metalloids. In some reactions, they behave like metals. In some reactions, they behave like Carbon does too sometimes. Well, that's true. Carbon's a very special element. <laughs> and it's good for us that it is. Otherwise, the immune systems would hardly work. Okay, so 
That's a major division. Then we have uh, vertical groups. We used to call them families. Either one's correct. Each is a group, and some of them have special names, you know, like the noble gases. These are the halogens, right? Everybody's, if you still, if you don't have, if you got a brand new car, it's probably got LED lights. But mine's old enough to have halogen bulbs in it. And they're mostly, they have iodine. Then you have the calcogens, which is named for oxygen, and that's, that's an ancient term. Um, or some debunked theories of that stuff. But we kept it as a as a name for the group. Some of the sulfur and oxygen are not at all alike in any way, shape, or form. No, they have similar, some of the, they have similar characteristics, but they're not exactly alike. No. no. Um, and these are nictogens, starts with a P. Panictogen. The P style. Um, I mentioned these, they're alkaline metals. These are alkaline earths. These are the transition metals. All these, for obvious reasons, you're transitioning from here to here. And then these two groups are, these are the lanthanides, right? We have a gap right in here. In 57 to 72, we fit this whole row right in here. And then, but these are not, these are not technically speaking groups because they're not particles. But I'm going to mention them anyway. And the only reason we don't stick them in here is because it makes a chart cover the whole wall and lots of blank space. So we just pull them out here and you know that all these fit right in there. These actinides fit right in here. So lanthanum starts this group, actinium starts that group. And the, uh, the actinides are the ones that have the uh, city colors. Uranium. Uranium. Become. <clears throat> okay. Uh, you'll also notice that the, um, the numbers for these groups now are from left to right, 1 through 18. I don't know why they did that. Because it used to be easier with a system that has the A's and B's numbers. You had 1A, 2A, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, A. And then down here, you had um, some A's and B's, I think. But what that did was that actually it was it's uh, based upon the idea of the octet. So you have, if you go from that side to this side, you have eight elements there, eight elements there. So if, once you reach your full octet of electrons, you have a noble gas. We'll talk about that a little more detail later. We're just trying to describe the periodic table and its construction at this point. Okay, I mentioned the charges before. Uh, you need to know those because when you start writing compounds, it's important to know what the charge is. Now, what type of compounds are there? Well, we're gonna start with binary compounds. That is, they have, they have two elements, or actually, they can have two groups of ions. They have a cation and an anion. Um, we're gonna start off with elements, where we have a cation first, and then an anion, like sodium and chlorine. Uh, but you can also have some, what we call polyatomic ions that behave as a single unit. Okay, we'll get to those later. Um, and we can, we're going to start off uh, treating them as ions. And then when we get to covalent compounds, we're going to continue the nomenclature for those covalent compounds, uh, recognizing that they're not really ions, but we're going to put them in that, in ionic positions, okay? Just for convenience. Hydrogen bonds. Are we going to go with those? Later. Um, so, uh, if you have a metal and a non-metal, you treat it as an ionic compound. If you have a non-metal and a non-metal, you treat it as a covalent compound, right? 
but there are three types of, of compounds that we're going to uh, propose rules for naming. So if you have a binary compound with a metal whose charge is always the same, fixed, never changes. Okay. So those would come from here. They're always plus one, always plus two, always plus three. Combined with an anion, uh, which the charge can vary there. <clears throat> But the key is the metal. The metal always has one charge. And the, the overarching rule for nomenclature, whether it's at our beginning level, whether it's more advanced levels, uh, organic chemistry, whatever, the overarching rule is non-ambiguity. The idea is that if you have a name written out for a compound, you can write the formula for that compound without making any mistakes. You can't write more than one formula for that same name. That's what I mean by no ambiguity. Or if you have a compound uh, written, you name it, there's only one way to name it. Right? You can't tolerate ambiguity in nomenclature. It would just be disastrous. It'd be kind of like American politics. Okay. So what we need is uh, a cation and an anion. And for instance, we'll go back to sodium. Right? So if we have this one, that one, then we would name it. The cation is always just the name of the element. And the anion, in most cases, we change, change the ending to IDE. So sodium chloride is that compound, and it's nothing else. It can't be anything else because this only has one charge, right? Makes one of these and one of these to neutralize. So when you write it that way, you know that's the only way that you can write this formula. If you have something like um, this one. How do you know if they're positive or negative? From where they come on the periodic table. Okay. Right. Over here, metals are positive. Okay. So if I say calcium chloride, let's write that one. Okay, we know the symbol, right? We know the symbol for this one. Right? Now we need the ratio. How many of each does it take to neutralize the charge? Fluorine is a halogen, right? It's going to be minus. Calcium is alkaline earth. So it's going to be a two plus charge, right? So you can't put them together or your compound will be chewed charged. So you need to neutralize this one with two of those. Right? So the total on the anion is two minus. Total on the cation is two plus. So with this name, since this can only be one charge, that's the only possibility. This is the only thing that you can come up with, CaCO2. So technically speaking, this hydrogen chloride is a um, salt? Hydrogen chloride? No, it's a gas. Well, yeah, it's a salt. Because it would be a yeah. negative and a positive. Because this is plus, this is minus. Hydrogen is a special case. Most of the time, if you have to choose, choose positive one. It's only negative in special cases. Hydrides, it turns negative. But for now, Treat it as if it were an alkaline metal. Okay? So these are examples, just like this magnesium comes from uh, the second group. Bromine is a halogen, so it takes two times minus one to, to balance a two plus. Oh. Well, so when I say salt, I mean any metal with a non metal is still a salt, right? Uh, yeah, well, technically, a, a salt is derived from the uh, reaction of an acid and a base. Okay. And in, in all the cases I can think of right now, that's true. Okay. Because the base is going to be um, 
a metal and a, hydro, a metal hydroxide, and the uh, acid is going to be uh, hydrogen plus some anion, but it's a salt. But in that case, a salt could have polyatomic ions. Now, did I hand out that uh, list of polyatomics already? Or is that, oh, that yeah. might be in your, uh, so. is, is it in your uh, review document? Look in your review document. Um, well, not that one. The original. There it is. Polyatomics. Yeah, this is what I'm looking for. Nice. Those are the common polyatomics. And they'll be in useful information in your exam. So you don't have to memorize them. Just become familiar with them. Um, you can do that reaction. Uh, say we have uh, polyatomic is two or more atoms bound together and acting as a single ion. And all of them but one in our list are negatives. Right? The only positive one is this one, ammonium. The ammonium ion is positive. All the rest of them are negative, like uh, this one, chlorate. Right. And they have they have specific names for each one of them. So when you put those in a compound, you just name them their name. You don't have to change the, the name until we get to acid and bases. So this would be ammonium, chlorate. And you don't have to say how many there are because one positive balanced one negative, that's the formula with, so, with, without the charges. I can't think of a time that ammonium isn't toxic. Well, ammonia is toxic, yeah, it's a gas. But ammonium, uh, is a nutrient. Right? Uh, a plant, love it. Okay. It's a source of nitrogen. Okay. So they can build their nucleic acids and their protein. Um, okay. So this is a case where um, a type 1 compound, type 1, is where the cation is a fixed charge. That's the important thing to take away from type 1. And then the anion is um, you change the ending. IDE. Okay. Okay, type 2. The cation variable charge and the same thing for this side that doesn't change just the cation cation has a variable charge for type 2 right? so in order to be non-ambiguous when you name the compound you have to say what the charge is right? most of those will come from transition metals and then down into this region here the transition metals and these can have multiple charges. So they would fall under type 2. Um, okay, so examples. Um, let's just take, let's take rust. Right? Fe2O3 is the formula. You have two iron atoms, three oxygen atoms. In that ratio, it's an ionic compound. So it's not a molecule, so it's going to be in a crystal lattice of some kind. But this is the simplest ratio of iron atoms to oxygen atoms. Two irons to every three oxygens in that mix. So how do we name it? Well, look where oxygen comes from. Right? It has a two minus charge. Okay. So what's the total charge on all of those oxygens? Three times two minus, right? Six minus, right? So we have to balance the six minus with a six plus on this side. So the cation has to supply six pluses to balance those six minuses, okay? 
but we've got two iron atoms, right? So we're going to divide them evenly. So each iron would be a three plus, wouldn't it? Okay. So now, now that we know what the charge is on the iron, we can name it. So remember, we don't change iron, we just say iron. There's. Well, that's old school. That's the way I had to learn it years ago. There is on the side. Uh, no, ah, not in this case. No. But you put the charge in there as a Roman numeral. Right? So we have iron with a three plus charge and then oxide. Okay, iron three oxide, which used to be called ferric oxide. The problem with the, this old way of doing it was you had to know what ferric means. Well, it's on the periodic table as ferrous. That's ferrum. Iron is ferrum. Yeah. Latin. Yeah. So when you say ferric, you mean three plus. Um, when you say ferrous, you mean two plus. Oh, no, I get it. For other things like um, manganese, when you say manganic, you mean four plus. When you say manganus, manganus, you mean two plus. So See, it's that's, easier to say manganese three. Yes, that's unambiguous. This is, is difficult to remember. You can always make a mistake. Because it, it, it means something in for one element and something different for another. So we did away with that one. And now you say the charge with a Roman rule. Okay. So let's let's do one. Um, let's do this one. Um, lead or oxide. And let's write the formula for that one. Okay. So lead is what symbol? Got it memorized yet? Um. Need to have it memorized. Okay. Lead is PV, plumbum for heavy. And then oxide, which is O. Okay. So now we need to know the charges on them so we can balance them. Right? Oxide is always two minus. Lead, we're told, is four plus, right? The name tells us what the charge is. Okay. So if we've got four plus for one lead, we've got to balance it with this one. How many of them do we need? Two. Because two times two minus is four minus. And now they balance. Right? So PbO2 is the formula for that compound. Okay. That's a type two where you have to specify the charge. Yeah. And that's only when the charge is variable. It could be two or more different charges. Some metals are unusual. Some metals have lots of possible charges. Yeah. Um, now, there are a couple of exceptions. One is silver, it's always plus one. But and if you're if you're trying to memorize all this stuff at once, and you say, okay, type two compounds form from metals in here. If you say silver one chloride, I'll accept it. Gold also doesn't play that. Yeah, it is non I think it has more than one charge though. It's a non-reactive, isn't it? That's like Gold can be plus one or plus three. Ah. Uh, zinc is also uh, two, two plus. Zinc is always two plus. But there again, I'll accept it if you if you use the type two convention. Okay. I want you to learn how to use the system first, then we'll deal with the particulars some other time. Okay. Type one, type two, type three. Type three compounds. These are metal on metal, metal on metal. These are non-metal, non-metal compounds. 
So both of the elements in that binary come from this side of the chart. Right? So if you're trying to figure out, if you're given a compound, you have to name it. Right? It's a decision tree. What do you do first? Is it metal non-metal or non-metal non-metal? Do that first. If it's non-metal, non-metal, then you go straight to type three. If it's metal, non-metal, you have to decide between type one and type two. So then you look at the metal. Where does the metal come from? Is it here, here, or here? Then it's type one. If it's any place else, type two. Okay. Now, how do we name non-metal, non-metal? You just say how much of each one there is. Okay. So if we have this one, we say di nitrogen. This is where you need to know your Greek prefixes. Right? They're listed somewhere. So one, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hesta, octa, nona, deca. Those are the, the ten prefixes. Di nitrogen, tetra, oxide. You still make the change in the name. Well, why not that nitrous catch oxide? Because we're using this convention and you don't change the name. Okay. I still I still like dihydrous monoxide instead of dihydrogen monoxide. You're talking about this one? I, uh, nitrous oxide? Yeah. That's the old name. This is dinitrogen monoxide. Okay. Black and gas. I'm thinking like water is dihydrogen monoxide. Dihydrogen monoxide. Yeah. Dihydrogen monoxide. There's a, uh, there was years ago a, a, a short paper, a blurb, circulated, and it's, it talks about the, the, the poison dihydrogen monoxide. It's Just banned. because people don't associate that with water. They took it seriously. Okay, so <clears throat> that's all you have to do. And if you have a name, <coughs> say we have um, this one. There, then we name that one. Right? So it's P, that's the phosphorus. So it would be dye. Phosphorus, five, and oxide. And to make it sound better, we left A out of penta. Rather than pentoxide, we said pentoxide. What's the pentoxide? It's the pentoxide. Yeah. And that's a, uh, what was that? The original, not the original. One in the middle. King Kong movies. The name of that petroleum company. Now that was Petrox. Yeah. Right. Where the guy got stepped on by the gorilla. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so you can go backwards and forwards. You just have to say how many of each. That's it. Now, if there's only one here, you don't say mono at the beginning. Mono never precedes a name. If you say uh, the element in this position, there's got to be at least one of them. We just we put mono over here just because it sounds right. And technically, you wouldn't have to say that either. You say if you had one nitrogen and one oxygen, you could say nitrogen oxide. But the convention is nitrogen monoxide, or CO is carbon monoxide. You know, the bad one. Uh, okay. So work out the uh, polyatomics. Okay, so for polyatomics, polyatomics fit in here or here. Right? They don't fit down here at all. They're up here. One of these. And it all depends on whether the metal is single charge or multiple possible charges. 
nitrogen hydroxide. Nitrogen hydroxide. You know H? Yeah, I've never seen that. Have you seen it? No, but I'm just, I'm saying. Yeah, that doesn't work. Okay, so like. Uh, uh, in, in a compound that has nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen together, the OH would not behave as a single. It wouldn't behave as a, as a hydroxide. They'd be independent. So in this case, hydroxide is polyatomic. It's sodium hydroxide. Uh, this is a, a good point to make here. Nitrate is always minus one charge. Right? But when you combine magnesium with it, which is a two plus charge, right? It comes from the second group. Then you need two of these negatives to balance that. But you can't go in here and change the subscripts on a polyatomic. That's forbidden. You have to, they act as a single unit, so you need two of them. That's why the parentheses. Then the parentheses is applied to that negative charge and balances that two plus. So whenever you have polyatomics, you have to treat them as a single unit. Um, how do you know if you have polyatomics? Well, you need to study the chart for one. That'll help you recognize some of them. But one clue is most of them have oxygen in them. So if you have a compound with three or more elements, one of them is oxygen, then just suspect polyatomic. And you might want to go look and see if it's there. So is okay. carbohydrate an ion? Carbohydrate. Yeah, carbohydrate. No, carbohydrate is, is a, an organic class of organic compounds. Okay. Carbohydrates have carbon, hydrogen, okay. and oxygen in them. Okay. So if we have glucose, we've got six of these, 12 of these, and six of those. And um, these would fall in this compound, this so, type. So why is it called hydrate? It's based upon that. Okay. It's okay. the ratio of two to one, same as water. Okay. And also, there's there's uh, it's uh, grandfathered in. ATE means oxygen. Ah. Uh. But when you get to organic compounds, there are different conventions for naming. Okay. We're talking about most of the all inorganic compounds now. Okay. Any questions so far? We have to talk about. Shoot, we're going to run out of time. I'm sorry. Can I take next more time? We have to talk about acids and bases mainly. The formula of an ionic compound. We we'll skip that. Type threes. We did that already. Oh, uh, there are your prefixes, right? I can memorize those. There are examples of type three compounds. A decision tree if you want to use it. I already gave you the decision tree. You say, is it metal or non-metal first? If it's not, then you go to this one. If it is, you have to decide between those two. Is it single charge, multiple charge? Acids. Okay. Naming acids. This is kind of, there's some archaic um, connection here <clears throat> with naming conventions. We just couldn't get away from it. Probably because the alchemists already had, had their acids named before we started modern chemistry. But uh, the first convention, well, first of all, how do you know it's an acid? It's got at least one of those to start with. The hydrogen. The hydrogen and everything after it. Right? So you put something after it. You know that's a high, that's a, an acid. So it could be it could be this, right? It could be this polyatomic. Uh, yeah, it could be this, or it could be um, it could it could require more than one. Right? 
Those are all acids. If they are dissolved in water, they have to be dissolved in water to be acid. In a liquid. Well, for our purposes, water. We're not talking about non aqueous solutions. Okay. <clears throat> so when they're dissolved in water, they're free to give up that hydrogen to a water molecule. That makes them an acid. Now, if they're not dissolved in water, say if you have HF gas, you name it hydrogen fluoride or hydrogen chloride. And these would be liquids anyway. So those are the ones you, if you find these, they're going to be dissolved in water. Okay, now that we know how to recognize an acid, how do you name it? Well, it depends on whether there's oxygen in the name. If there's no oxygen in the name, you start the name with hydro. Hydro. Because there's no oxygen. If there's oxygen, you don't say hydro. So what do you put after the hydro? Well, you take the hydrogen fluoride, fluoride, and change it to uh, it. I become it. So it's fluorine, hydrofluoric, or hydrochloric. Okay. If there's no, if there's oxygen in there, then you start with this part of the name. So this polyatomic is nitrate. And H become X. So it's nitric acid. 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 Well, this one, which is sulfate, H become X. So it's with a slight modification to make it sound right. Sulfuric. What if we had just this one? Like that. No oxygen. How do you start the name? Hydro. Then hydro sulfuric acid. See, there's a huge difference between sulfuric and hydrosulfuric. That formula versus this one. And if this is a gas, it's hydrogen sulfide. Um, you probably smell it if you get close to sulfur spring somewhere, green or white or whatever. How many colors are there? Sulfur springs around here. Green, white, I know. Is there a red sulfur spring? <laughs> okay. So you got some of this dissolved in the water. And it's a, it's a volatile gas, so as it comes out, it, a lot of it just vaporizes. But the rest of it hits your tongue and, and makes you unless you're used to it, I guess. They say it's good for you, but I don't want to find out. Okay, so what would happen though if this were H2SO3? That's a polytomic. What is SO3? It's sulfite. There's an oxygen, so we don't say hydro, but ice become uses. So we say sulfurous acid. Okay? There's an NO2 also that's nitrite, to be nitrous acid. Nitrous acid is a bad thing. Um, there are um, series in those polyatomics. Right? The one that's, that's most familiar is the one that uses that uh, series of halogen, halogen oxides. So we have uh, ClO3 is chlorate, right, for your polyatomics. And if you take away one oxygen, it's chlorite. 
take away another one is hypochlorite. Okay. So this is chlorate. This is chlorite. And this is hypo. You know, like hypodermic needle underneath, less than chloride. And then there's one more above, which is per. I guess per means bigger than chloride. Per chloride. So there's a family of polyatomics. If you learn this one and you know your suffixes and prefixes, you can generate the whole list. Or you can stick bromine in there. And you can say bromine, bromide, hypobromide, perbromide, or iodine in there. You can say iodine, iodide, hypoiodide, or periodide. So you got those three. I mean, all you have to know is how to do it, and you got 12 right there, easy. Iodine doesn't make as strong an acid as other things do. What is? Iodine doesn't make as strong as acid as chlorine or chlorine. Because it's bigger, spreads the charge out over larger areas. Okay, now we want to make an acid out of each one of these. So remember, H become, and there's no hydros in here. Right? They're all oxygens. So if we add a hydrogen to each one, that neutralizes that one because hydrogen is plus one charge. So now we have our acids. So what is this one going to be? Start with this one. This one would be chloric acid. Right? How about this one? This chlorous acid. How about this one? Hypo chlorous. Okay, how about this one? Whoops. Eight. Eight becomes it. Per chloric. That's a nasty one. We should use that in the lab to digest plant material. Okay, so there's your series of acids. Um, I'll let you do those on your own. Bases are really simple, so we didn't hammer those too hard. All you have to do with a base is just what is the metal with it? Sodium. Hydroxide. That's it. Because the base is a metal with an element, right? Yeah. So it would be like lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, those are all bases. TH value. Okay. So we need we need to get down the hall and uh, and do our labs. See how much time we have. So three fifty. Okay, we might be okay. Is there a hydrogen hydroxide? Yes. <laughs> water. <laughs> okay, so that's what base is. So water is technically a base. Um, water is a. Um, oh. Shoot, I lost the word. I'll think of it in a minute. 